I'm approaching this from two different uh, points of view. Uh, I have various different uh, frames of reference when I think about consent as uh, A, of course, uh, being a man. Uh, B, of being the head of an organization where I'm interacting with everybody who's probably reporting to me. Uh, C, of being maybe older in age than most of the people I'm working with uh, in that organization or in training environments that I am. And I find that I'm continuously in all of these spaces, really... Uh, um, now I guess it's with you know having so much uh, experience of doing it, but uh, very very conscious on on the back foot in some way of thinking about when a boundary is being crossed, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, uh, so would definitely like to place that as as one frame of reference that I have. Uh, the other is that a lot of um, online conversation, you know. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of online conversation on consent, not just now, but from much earlier, where I remember many years ago, there was some college that was framing it, some college in the US, I think, I read this when I was in college, uh, and was looking at, um, you know, gender and sexuality events happening in college, and a college in the US had, in the early 2000s, framed some kind of policy that people had to sign when entering uh, the hostel. And I thought it was a great way of just actually having that conversation because my first reaction was, wow, these people are having sex in college. Uh, <laughs> you know. That uh, is loud. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, so uh, I think uh, what I was saying from that is that I think uh, online conversation uh, started by that and it became a, a, a matter of humor. Everybody was then talking about this detailed form. I remember there was these videos about this form, this consent form that you have to sign in interactions before you're, you know, at the end of a date before you start actually, um, you know, having sex with somebody, there is this long form and a checklist that you have to sign, uh, which became this really, really humorous, funny thing uh, to do uh, while you're on a date. And, and much later, uh, clearly I was not very um, exciting in terms of having a life in college, but much later when I was then navigating as a, as a, queer man, this whole thing of online dating, actually. Uh, I thought back on it and said, oh, actually, this is conversation is very easy to have. Uh, I don't know if it happens differently for straight couples, if it happens differently for women, uh, queer women interacting with each other, but for men, actually. In online dating, it's very clear. The conversation is just, it's the first thing you have a lot of times when you interact with people. There is a conversation about what you want to do, what you don't want to do, whether you want to go out, whether you want to meet in somebody's house, what will you do over there, what exactly will be the logistics of it. Uh, this conversation is not very difficult to have, actually. So again, I mean, it's a confusing space where you say that it's actually, you know, how much, how much detail do you ask before, but people are actually asking it. Uh, so, so it's clearly not something that is unheard of or is so funny or out there that it can't be done. So it's at odds with what we are also, you know, what my, I myself also feel sometimes about how much room for, uh, you know, knowing the exact boundary, not doing something, do I ask before I hold somebody's hand, or do you ask, how much do you ask, and, and what all, and at what all stage. And I think it's important to, uh, you know, have that conversation on how to do that in a way uh, that really doesn't have to take away from your experience of actually being intimate, being <coughs> playful, being romantic, being any of those things. Um, and figuring out this whole sort of uh, interaction. Uh, the workspace dynamic, which is very clear and out there in the films, is an important one, I think, also, because that's a very different space. And uh, while I find that a lot of online conversation now is like, you know, Madhu was also discussing earlier, saying uh, it is very black and white. It is pushing to saying have a very clear idea of, you know, this is consent, this is non-consent. I find uh, a lot of conversations that are public pushing for that kind of clarity of saying, yes, this is also non-consent. Yes, this is also a boundary. Yes, this is also, you know, should be clearer. Uh, but a lot of work that I've done with young people, with adolescents particularly, and that is a challenge space in itself because adolescent sexuality in itself is, uh, like Madhu pointed out earlier, like uh, consent does not even apply to me being able to give information about safe sex. Uh, that is also, I mean, there is no consent. There is no consent under 18. Uh, and so how do we navigate a space and talk about consent for people who, by law, are unable to give consent even to having that conversation uh, is one challenge. But the other is that the conversation there and the questions there have been actually fairly nuanced. The question has been of, you know, kitni bar puchu before it becomes a problem. It has not been, you know, I can't ask, he should not ask. It has always been, you know, wo ladka pehli bar mein to haan, mere ko poolega to haan to nahi kar dungi. Uh, it is that conversation in, you know, whenever consent and things around relationships and how to really 
tell somebody that you like them comes up in groups of young people because it's a fundamentally important to your being issue like what do i say how much do i say this girl has asked me if i watch blue films now if i say yes she will think i'm a bad boy but if i say no she tell me i'm lying what do i say uh you know there is no right answer to those kinds of things and then uh i think in that the conversation actually is already at that level of saying you know uh the third time maybe i will say yes the first time i will of course say no uh it is also coming to that level of you know having taught a lot of young women young girls that saying no is okay but uh, maybe missed having done the other part of saying how do you really say uh, you know i like you in a way that is not threatening uh because the gender dynamic of how my, how do you feel fear how do you feel vulnerable in a relationship or in an interaction is very very real it is you know that kind of fear of somebody uh when i might say no to them in a space where there is nobody but me and that person around is not my experience at this moment and and that's very that's important to note uh it's like actually this fear you experience while traveling back in a taxi in the middle of the night is not my experience it will not be my experience so uh that's something that i am also learning continuously when i hear young girls women talk about you know okay how do i really say no if a tinder date comes to my house and then things are going in a certain way and i wanted to stop how do i really navigate that experience two in a community when a boy and i are standing um, you know in the park and three people are looking at me and will probably tell my brother what happened over there later i cannot say yes i cannot even express it non verbally i can't do anything except scream at him and run away but i actually might want to say yes at some point of time later and how do i navigate that so i think uh that conversation uh is uh an important one to have uh, how to do that is something that uh, you know i find myself continuously wanting to have new ways of talking about that with young people uh because it's difficult uh, but that conversation is already happening it's not like it's not there it's on everybody's mind uh and i think uh, a lot of this uh happens in institutions uh if it's not the workspace it is a coaching center it is a you know training center it is some space like that where there will be a formality around how consent can become very very legally difficult where it can create legal situations it can create a you know institutionalize it can lead to an institutionalized system having to get into that conversation uh and i think uh maybe we can even begin to have a conversation now on how do you separate the two when is the intervention required when is the intervention not required because we've also sort of historically challenged this thing of saying no that why why would a system want to get in from the point of view of only you know sula karwana when you know that somebody is actually feeling challenged when you know somebody is actually feeling violence and violated uh so i think uh, i think uh, i don't have anything to sort of bring it together and say how to do consent uh i don't think there is one way of how to do consent that exists uh continuously one is pushing for just ways in which people can be more and more uh, aware of their own and other people's boundaries uh and uh whether it is asking verbally whether it is non verbally picking up cues or whether it is just um you know having that in the back of your mind when you're having an interaction i think that's the conversation that i am now able to have after a long time with groups of young people with uh, people openly in sort of trainings at work at the workplace with my colleagues uh, and i think um, more and more space for that conversation to be able to get into the gray areas without having a you know a legal system or a redress system which is actually very good hanging on it like a sword uh, is important and i think uh, that's something that we can definitely take up also